The following podcast was recorded on Wednesday, February 10th, 2021, featuring Jim Bianco of Bianco Research and Ben Breitholtz of Arbor Data Science. To hear the podcast in real time, you can sign up for a free trial at biancoresearch.com or arborresearch.com or by emailing Gus Handler directly at gus.handler at arborresearch.com. You can also call Arbor Research and Trading at 1-800-606-1872. Thanks for your time and enjoy the podcast. Welcome to the latest edition of Talking Data. Our Talking Data series seeks to offer timely insights into macro market themes along with macro data and its impact on the economy and markets. I'm your host, Kristen Radish of Arbor Research and Trading. Our presenters today are Jim Bianco of Bianco Research and Ben Breitholtz of Arbor Data Science. Today we'll be discussing the latest CPI report. It's hot off the press, Jim. What are we seeing today? Yeah, it came in a little bit light than expected. Um, The street, the bond market had been getting itself worked up about the idea that inflation was going to return. It didn't show up in this report, especially at the core level, which came in unchanged again when they were expecting a two-tenths rise. The things that were driving it lower at the headline level was a gigantic fall in gasoline prices. Energy prices came down quite a bit. At the core level, there was a lot of um, seasonal effects on cars. There was seasonal effects on airline tickets uh, as well, too. And there's also been the depressant that's been out there on core about housing. And a quick word about that. Uh, The way that inflation is measured at the housing levels, they do owner's equivalent rent. That is the way that uh, they impute what you could rent your house for or your apartment for. And then they look at those changes as opposed to just the pure price, because that could be financially driven and not always inflation driven as well, too. The issue that they're struggling with with owner's equivalent rent is there's a rent uh, there's a rent moratorium out there. And so a lot of people are not paying their rents and they don't have to by law. So when they measure this stuff and they ask a apartment complex or somebody, how much money did you receive in rent this month? Well, it's a lot less because people by law don't have to, are, are, they're not paying and by, by law, you don't have to evict them. Uh, and so it's skewing those numbers downward because when they invented this, no one ever anticipated, oh yeah, people won't pay their rent and the government will pass a law that says you can't evict them. And so it's kind of messing up uh, that whole uh, measurement. That should rebound smartly once the economy reopens and people start paying their rent either later this year or next year. But right now it's been a big depressant on the numbers. So all in all, the data is not yet showing that we've got inflation, but the base effects that everybody talks about March, April, May, when we drop off March, April, May of last year are still to come. All right, so here's my scientific assessment. It's for inflation here for for last month. I think that the, the OER, like Jim, touched on is critical. We need to see that rebound. The moratorium will be part of that. The other part of it too is we still have, you know, three and a half million permanent job losses out there. And, you know, people are still struggling to make some of these payments potentially. And yeah, once the vaccine is is fully, you know, embedded in the uh, economy and people are able to get back out, uh, seek new apartments and make the moves, pay and hopefully have the income to pay for them. Uh, that's great. That hopefully will uh, give rise to OER. But uh, looking at search activity for apartment related information and rent, that still remains somewhat, you know, it's kind of uh, balanced in that we're still getting, yeah, we're getting some people looking for one bedroom apartments and for, you know, leasing terms, but there's still a lot of on the negative side, especially on the labor front. And we build some neat models to kind of forecast where we think OER will go over the next 12 months. And those those models still predict that OER will be running around 2%, you know, maybe 2.2%. Uh, over the next 12 months, which is not exactly what we need to see to get some, you know, higher run inflation. Last month, uh, shelter rose at about 10 basis points. That's not enough. Bigger picture, core CPI needs to run around 20 basis points or so for it to be of interest. Anything that's zero or, you know, 15 to 15 basis points is not enough to get uh, things moving, especially get the Fed concerned and so on. And one thing I'll say really quickly is, totally disregard year over year numbers going forward. Everything's about the month to month um, because we'll have the base effects that will kick in for sure in earnest in April. 
So Ben, what are the markets telling us then? Markets, this, this is where things get confusing. So the tips break even market is probably the most you know watched that has been on fire. Uh, we have the five year tips break even all the way around all the way up at 230 basis points. I believe the five year five year forward is even higher. So markets are pricing in this, you know, this this inflation running at headline that is running above two percent. There's some confusion uh, because there's a lot of liquidity concerns, risk premiums that get built into tips built into tips break evens. When you try to de decompose them, kind of like the DKW models and others, you end up with a much lower inflation expectation. So if you the latest update that was ran through the end of January showed that uh, PCE should be somewhere around in terms of expectations for the next summer uh, five years somewhere around 1.2 1.3%. Uh, that is dastardly low. That's very different from the tips break even market itself. Uh, but uh, with that being said, there are signs that uh, that this inflation is is showing up. And just depends on how much it translates over to the consumer. Like Jim will probably talk about on the commodity front, markets are saying that there is demand here, especially from China, that's goosing and giving rise to raw industrial metals, as well as grains, especially. Uh, the volatility there in commodities is just um, kind of exploded relative to the rest of the universe. And if you look at commodity implied volatility relative to like rate volatility or even tips volatility, it's running um, at, at quite a divergence and quite a, a spread. I think that um, uh, the same thing's happening relative to currencies and so on. So we have this decision that's going to have to be made uh, by bond investors and also risk assets to incorporate interest rate risk and inflation risk at some point. If this these commodity volatility and um, and tips break even and the expectations remain high, will that come to fruition with you know an actual core inflation print finally posting 20, 25 basis points? We'll have to see. But there is this divergence that's uh, present right now. Yeah, I, I see that too. Um, I'll go through and, and when it comes to what the markets are saying, I want to emphasize that it's expected nominal GDP, fancy word, that drives uh, interest rates. Why should an interest rate be a 10 or negative or two or whatever it is? What do you expect the nominal growth of your country to be? Expected, not past. And that is a combination of real growth, let's call that reflation, and inflation. So I've been trying to emphasize there's R for reflation or real growth, and there's I for inflation. For the last 25 years, we have never had to worry about I. It's always been about R. It's whether or not the economy is real growth is expanding or real growth is contracting uh, as well, too. And so what you're seeing in commodity prices is you're seeing commodity prices go up at the industrial level. Steel prices um, are starting to move up. And nominal interest rates have been percolating. You know, we kind of got up real briefly over 2% on the 30-year uh, earlier this week for about one second, and we're a little bit below it right now. And this belief that maybe, let's call it nominal growth is going to be expanding, but we haven't yet kind of cut the difference between nominal, uh, between inflation and reflation, and here's the problem. When you start going down more nominal growth, it doesn't matter if it's R or I, you first get the same response. Commodity prices move up, energy prices go, our energy stocks go, industrial basic material stocks go, you know, the, the laggards like healthcare and consumer discretionary laggards relative to the inflation beneficiary stocks um, continue. That's the same in the beginning stages, whether you're gonna get massive real growth or massive inflation, uh, not massive inflation, but inflation. And so, we, you know, the markets are not yet discriminating which one they're getting. They're just telling us we're going to get more nominal growth as we move forward from here. And that's what interest rates have been responding to. And the final thought is, why does it matter? I've been arguing that if interest rates go up because real growth is coming back in a big way without inflation, that's okay for risk markets. That's good for the economy. It's an indication that things are getting better. The Fed could step in with QE and yield curve control, and it'd probably work. If interest rates are rising because that I component, inflation, which we haven't seen, God, who knows how long, decades, if that's what's moving it higher, then markets are going to be a little bit more bothered by rising rates. If the Fed wants to try and squash interest rates down in the face of rising inflation, 
I think that that's going to be problematic for markets as well, too. We're still in a holding pattern right now. We don't know which one it's going to be. We just know that nominal growth should be picking up, and we haven't quite figured out whether it's going to, how much of it's going to be R, how much of it is going to be I. So let's conclude today's podcast. Ben, why don't you give us your thoughts on expectations moving forward, and Jim, any final thoughts after that as well, please? I think investors are really focused on global synchronized growth and kind of the story that Jim was talking about. We have this big nominal growth. It's going to be global in nature. It's going to be ubiquitous. It will see a little bit of inflation. And that's how the flows have gone. So if you look at ETF flows, we've seen just a tidal wave go back into risk assets. You know, 75 cents in every dollar is going into equities. There's a large portion of that, maybe 20 to 30 cents is going into the global marketplace. And then a small portion, about 10%, which isn't small in terms of the total, um, as a, in terms of the total piece of the pie, but into inflation um, related, you know, like tips, ETS. And talking about that, those inflation friendly assets have seen almost $30 billion of inflows in terms of ETFs over the past three months. That's huge. That's the most really, um, you're really on record. And that includes things like energy, materials, tips, and so on. So the market's getting primed and getting ready for this big growth story. And so it's, it needs to show up. And I think the same thing for inflation. With tips break-evens producing their highest sharp ratio on record, uh, around seven, eight to one on a rolling three-month basis, uh, there is a lot of money that's kind of focused on this reflation story. So if we don't get global synchronized growth to really come to fruition by the summer months, and we do not see core CPI posting you know, 20 plus basis points um, month over month by the summer months, I think some of the story gets suspect and becomes concerning I don't know how much that means of a setback for risk assets. It might not be anything too large, but it means this reflation story would have to deflate, so to speak. And some of this money is gonna have to rush out of these um, inflation-friendly assets. And that's one area I'd be kind of concerned and watching. I don't necessarily think that's going to happen. Um, It seems like, you know, markets, if you do some use risk assets to price where TIS break even should be, they should be healthy around 230 basis points. Um, But again, we need to see evidence here uh, by the summer months. But I'm very much with Jim. This is a holding pattern. um, And maybe that's why things are so tranquil and we're getting some of these disconnections and volatility and it's not really freaking anybody out between commodities, currencies, and and interest rates. Uh, So we'll see how that shifts once we get into, you know, May and June when things, you know, we need to see evidence by that point. I would add that I think a, a lot of the concern, especially at the political level, has been about demand pull inflation, that we're mailing people money, my favorite firm term of the week, and we are expecting that money to mean something. Well, right now, we all think it means Robinhood accounts and more volatility in the stock market. But eventually, when the economy recovers and people get a little more confidence, they're going to start spending that money. And that's where people think that the inflation will come from. I'm in that camp as well, too. Uh, Adjacent with that story is there are left of center economists that say, oh, this is just filling the hole. We haven't hit the output gap. This is not going to produce inflation. And that somewhat assumes that after we pass this bill, say, next week, and everybody gets a $1,400 check, that we're done. But if we pass this bill and send everybody a $1,400 check and there is no inflation, we've already got Republican Mitt Romney proposing monthly checks to everybody that is a kid in the country um, up to $13,000 a year. That's basically universal basic income. We've got a number of, of Democrat senators that are pushing for giant infrastructure bills and maybe even more checks to come down the line. And as I've been fond of saying on this podcast, If there isn't a consequence, if you mail people money and the poor get help and the unemployed get a bridge to their next job by getting more unemployment insurance and the rich to find is equity holders, see new highs, it's really hard to say, okay, we're done with that. We're not gonna send you any more money, but it's gonna be a big scream to do it again and do it again and do it again. And I think that that's kind of what's overriding this idea about why we might get inflation because there is no, stopping this unless there is a consequence. One consequence can be inflation. That adver- It gives an adverse reaction in markets and people say, oh, we went too far, we gotta stop doing it. Um, but 
to say that they're voluntarily going to say, okay, the $1,400 checks, that's it. I remember back in the spring when they said the $1,200 checks was going to be it. And we've already nailed another $600. And we're now talking about another $1,400 on top of that. And then we're talking about monthly child care payments, uh, monthly child payments um, as soon as we're done with this uh, as well, too. So that is what I think is the poll that we're going to have to look at for the rest of 21 and the question that's going to have to be answered. Are we going too far with the stimulus and will it create inflation? And maybe it doesn't. But I think a lot of people, and I'm in this camp, think it might. Well, thank you, Jim and Ben, for your thoughts today. We really appreciate it. And thank you to our audience for joining us. As a reminder, Arbor Research and Trading is an institutional research and brokerage firm. Our two most prominent research offerings are Bianco Research and Arbor Data Science. For further information, please contact Gus Handler at gus.handler at arborresearch.com. Have a great day.